Good evening, all. It's an uh, unusual uh, honor and pleasure to speak in a place like this, which is sort of defining the uh, Jewish history of Baltimore. This was, of course, as we all know, the first real synagogue over here, uh, back in the time of the 1840s when Rabbi Rice uh, was uh, here fighting with his uh, congregants and uh, site of many uh, Jewish events and uh, battles. And, of course, as we know later on, uh, she went through all kinds of uh, metamorphoses with the church for a while, and then was once again repurchased by the uh, East European Jews when they flooded this neighborhood in the late 1800s. It became uh, the Shomer Mishmeres Shul, so this is where Rabbi Schwartz, uh, Oliver Shalom, and many other uh, famous people uh, began. This is where TA started, that was to use Baltimore talk. And uh, they've changed here the decor, I can see, uh, to take it away from what it looked like in the time of the Shomer Mishmeris, which after all was a Hasidic congregation. They had a Litvish a rabbi, because uh, they had a lot of common sense, but they, uh, but they, uh, well, they took a Telzer, you know, Rabbi Schwartz. But uh, the decor looked different. However, they've changed it to, as far as I can tell, make it look like it did uh, when the Shul was first uh, built in the 1840s, which has kind of like a church type uh, of architecture over here, which uh, bespeaks the desire of the new uh, German Jews who had come to this country to fit into the American reality, right? to fit into the American reality. It was mentioned before that there's a very interesting exhibit that I, I would recommend. Once you're here, take advantage of it. When this is over, before you go over for the main event, I'm talking about 80s food, but I'm not stupid, you know. He says, before you uh, go over there, if you walk downstairs, a little bit rickety, they have a nice little museum display with some of the fights of, that took place over here between the Orthodox and the Reform. Uh, I disagree with a lot of the interpretation, but that's not the point. And you can see the old mikvah that now has been in the newspapers that they uh, discovered just don't fall in. And you can also see the old matzah factory, which I think goes back to the German times. And uh, it's a rare opportunity. Most of us don't get uh, the, the chance, or our, our schedules don't take us down here that often. And uh, you can learn a little bit uh, in terms of the reality of the Baltimore past. Having said that, uh, let's get down to uh, business. The uh, title today, of course, had to do with battles uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, the Jews and the Egyptians over the Passover narrative. Uh, Alan and I came up with this title simply because we live, unfortunately, in a time in which um, some people are aware and active in it, uh, the state of Israel and many Jews are engaged in uh, battles of legitimization and delegitimation uh, and struggles over the narrative of the state of Israel. Um, some people think that the creation of the state of Israel is a wonderful thing. Others will turn it into a terrible thing. And uh, whose truth is it? Uh, who's right? Uh, the future of uh, Israel and so much else depends, uh, whether we like it or not, in uh, which narrative gets out there. And I'm not going to suggest that we're doing a great job. It's a part, it defines the times in which we live, and it's one of the challenges that we, as American Jews, um, have to face up to. A number of years ago, uh, 20 years ago, something like that, I got a phone call once. I've told this story before from the uh, Baltimore Sun. Uh, before I was involved in the rabbi business, in the pulpit rabbi business, and the reporter called up from the Sun, and he said, uh, this is Rabbi Katia, I want to ask you a question uh, about the date of Passover. I said, what's going on over here? Turns out it was around this time of the year, and they do, as the Baltimore Sun does, you know, a piece on the holiday about Passover. And uh, they were interviewing Rabbi Menachem Goldberger, who shows next to ours, and he was telling them all about Pesach. And then the reporter said, what, when did it take place? And he said, I don't know, I called Ask David Katz. You know. And so that's what he did. And he says, you know, I'm calling for Baltimore. So what, what year was the exodus of Egypt? And I already started getting it. I said, well, you know, it depends how you reckon the uh, chronology over here. You know, if you go to traditional rabbinic chronology, it's something like in the 1270s or whatever, something like that. If you go, on the other hand, there's a problem with the chronology. And he said, well, like, this is not science. This is journalism. Just give me a date. You understand? But they just want a story. And it's interesting because if I would have gone into it, it would be kind of tricky. Uh, 3,000 years ago, we have no, 3,300 years ago, which is when we reckon the Exodus was, we have no historical evidence for this whatsoever. 
Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, Dover, Shlomo, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, all the other biblical characters, we have practically no historical evidence for it. There's no historical evidence that I know of that the Jews were ever in Egypt, or let alone that there was a Moses, or uh, all the rest of the story. Um, what we do have historical evidence for is, about six or seven hundred years later, something like that, Egyptians are angry at our story. And they say, it's not true, they have a different story. When you get to the third century, when a, a very famous Egyptian priest slash historian, Manitho, uh, who's a leading figure in the Egyptian history, can everybody hear me? Somebody want to help me with this? Is this better? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. Can you all hear me? I don't know what to do. They can't hear. Okay, I'm going to scream real loud. Can you all hear me now? Okay, we'll have to do like in Shul. The, uh, anyway, if you go back to the third uh, century, um, you find... that this Egyptian fellow, who was an important uh, priest, and uh, was a high priest for the uh, Egyptian king at that time, Manitho writes a history of Egypt, of ancient Egypt. We always think that uh, 200 BC was ancient time, but to them was the modern period. They were taught looking thousands of years before then. And he writes a famous work in Greek called the Egyptiakia, which is Egypt's stuff. And he gives all the past uh, dynasties of Egypt and the uh, famous histories of the pharaohs and all that kind of business. And it's a very famous work, except it didn't survive. Uh, but it survived in certain fragments, mainly because in it he strongly attacks uh, the Jews and the Jewish narrative of the exodus of Egypt. And he says it's not true. And he says, we Egyptians have ancient records uh, of what really happened. And uh, this is very interesting. Because the Torah has a bunch of stories and other things like that, as we all know. Um, has, of course, the famous story, one of the most famous parts of the Torah is the uh, story of the exodus from Egypt. Um, this is something that's captured the imagination of people around the world, Jewish or not. Uh, Baltimore was a slave town here 160 years ago, right? It's below the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, there were debates about slavery in the pulpit that I'm standing on at the moment, once upon a time. And uh, the slaves in America, the black slaves in America, looked, for example, to the biblical story of Moses and Pharaoh and God's deliverance as a source of hope for them. This is true for uh, peoples around the world. And so the very story of the Bible, the Old Testament, has captured the imagination of people even if they're not Jewish. But you don't like it if you're an Egyptian. It is, uh, Torah is, among other things, a kind of anti-Egyptian kind of anti document, don't you agree? I mean, uh, who's the good guy? Moses. Who's the villain? Pharaoh. Who are the nice people? The Hebrew slaves. Who are the oppressors? Who throw babies in the water? Who tell the midwives to strangle the infants? Uh, if you're an Egyptian, you might be a little bit turned off by this. Get it? And, uh, and they were. And so the result is that they say it's not true. And you guys are liars, and we have the actual truth, and here's the real story, and in their version, uh, guess who's the hero, and guess who is the villain? You flip it. Of course, Pharaoh will be the hero, as you'll see in a second, and Moses, of course, will be the villain. And same thing across the board. Why does this appear in an Egyptian book for the first time in the third century? I mean, Egyptian has been around for a long time. Uh, why isn't this... Why is this in 250 BC? Why is this in 350 BC? 450, 550, and all the rest of it. I mean, what do we know about this period in history that would make us understand this? Not too hard. Um, one of the big stories that happens in Jewish history and in world history, right around that time, is the translation of the Bible for the first time into Greek. 
The Torah had been around for a long time. It was in Hebrew. When the Torah is in Hebrew, it can only be read by, read by people who can read Hebrew, which is not many. Never was. On the other hand, a Greek in the third century, that's after Alexander the Great, has conquered the Persian Empire, and his successors have established the famous Hellenistic empires of old, uh, the king of the north, the king of the south, the way the book of Daniel puts it, the Seleucid Empire, for example, the Ptolemy Empire, Egypt, Syria, uh, these were Greek cultural kingdoms. This is actually called in history the Hellenistic era. And if you put a book out in Greek, it could be read by people all across the world at that time, or across that part of the world. And so for the first time, uh, the Jewish narrative is out there for everyone to read. Okay? Uh, in the 300s, Alexander the Great had conquered, as we all know, this great Persian Empire, including Egypt. And then he died shortly after he triumphed. According to many sources, he just drunk too much at a party, but whatever the case is, he left it to his generals. Alexander was not Greek, he was Macedonian. He actually uh, destroyed the Greeks. Uh, he crushed them. He and his father, Philip of Macedon, um, enslaved the Greeks. The famous Demosthenes of Athens, who wrote the Philippics, was always warning against Philip of Macedon, against his father. But in spite of that, Alexander was educated in the Greek language and Greek culture by Aristotle, and his successors pervade this kind of culture all throughout the world at that time, including Egypt. It's called the Hellenistic era because, I don't know if anybody remembers the news item a couple years ago, the Taliban in Afghanistan, not that long ago, dynamited, they blew up old Greek temples from Alexander the Great's time, a little afterwards, because they viewed them from the Islamic perspective as being pagan and therefore not worthy of being permitted to, re to remain. That goes to show you how, if in Afghanistan, of all places, you had Greek temples and Greek uh, buildings, it shows you how widely pervasive the Hellenistic and the Greek culture was in that era. Okay, so if you're putting the book out in Hebrew, uh, the book that formerly was in Hebrew, now in the Greek, everybody can read the story people never heard about before. Uh, why did the Greeks want the Bible translated into Greek? It's not clear. Uh, there are all kinds of controversial stories connected with it. There are two famous tales, one in the Gemara, in the Talmud, and one in the Pseudepigraphus, they call it in the Greek writings, both of which say that King Ptolemy II, who was a famous uh, king once upon a time, uh, he either forced a bunch of rabbis to show up in Egypt and translate it, or he invited them. Uh, according to the Talmud, he kind of forced them, put them in separate rooms and tried to see if they would come up with different versions of it, according to a famous book called the Le Letter of Aristeus to Philocrates, which is, I know, a bestseller, but once upon a time was. Right? Well, it's on your pseudepigrapha shelf at Barnes & Noble. The, uh, well, it's a wonderful story, though. Uh, the king of Egypt invites the wise men of Jerusalem to come to Egypt. He throws this huge banquet that goes for pages and pages as the king asked him, who is wise among the Jews? Who is considered truly wealthy or happy? Uh, why do you guys not eat uh, rabbits? Why do you guys uh, you know, not eat camels? Uh, what's all the strange things that you Jews do? And the rabbis give them answers one page after another. And when it's all over, they retire very happily to an island somewhere in Egypt. And they write the Torah to translate it into Greek and everybody's happy. So one version of the story is that it was a negative phenomenon. The other one is that it's a positive phenomenon. I know you'll be shocked to find that Jews are of two minds on anything. And uh, indeed, in those days, the big question was, should you or should you not translate the Bible into another language? We have these issues today where should you translate the Talmud into another language? Or, but, but they did it. Okay? And uh, how and when and precisely when, we don't know with exactitude, but we know what happens around this time. And so now you're a Greek, a, a Syrian, a Babylonian uh, intellectual, and you read this book for the first time, and you see there was this guy named Moses and this idiot named Pharaoh, and you know the story, let my people go. Pharaoh said, I will not let them go. He said, yes, you will. And by the time it's over, he lets them go. He has to run in the middle of the night and tell Moses, please leave and pray for me on the way out. To even give their money to the Jews. If you're an Egyptian, particularly if you're an Egyptian aristocrat, a uh, member of the middle class or upper class, which Manitho and others are, uh, who made up this garbage? Right? This is a, an attack on Egyptianism and uh, our culture, and it's totally wrong. And so, as I said, 
they produce, or he does, a counter-narrative, which he claims is based on ancient Egyptian records. This is the only non-biblical possible, possible source of ancient records about uh, Moses and the Israelites and things of that nature. But it's a different story. Um, I'll read you a very brief uh, version of this, and maybe a little bit later uh, the way a Roman would put it out there. Uh, as he says over here, is Manizo tells the story of Osirsef, uh, according to Josephus, and Josephus wrote a whole book attacking this. Uh, Manizo described Osirsef as a tyrannical high priest of Osiris at Heliopolis. He was an Egyptian priest. Pharaoh Amenhopus had a desire to see the gods. But in order to do so, he first had to cleanse Egypt of lepers and other polluted people. So the country is, as we say in Hebrew, Tomei, is unclean. And so he collected them, set 80,000 of them to work in stone quarries and confined them to Avaris, the capital city. So I guess he planned to uh, kill them through hard labor. There, Osirsef became their leader, the leader and others of the lepers and of the unclean people. And he ordered them to give up the worship of the gods and to eat the meat of the holy animals. Because in Egypt, um, I'm sure many know this, the animals were uh, worshipped, uh, just about every animal. Um, the Osirsefites then invited the Hyksos into Egypt. This was a foreign invading group. And together with their new allies, they drove the pharaoh and his son Ramses into exile in Nubia and started a 13-year reign of religious oppression. In other words, religious oppression of the Egyptians. Um, towns and temples were devastated. The images of the gods were destroyed. The sanctuaries were turned into kitchens. The sacred animals were roasted over fires. Until finally, the pharaoh and his son returned to expel the lepers and the, enemy, and the invaders and restore the old Egyptian religion. Towards the end of the story, Manetho, the author, tells us that Osirsef eventually took the name of Moses. Oh, so that's who he is. Moses is a renegade Egyptian priest. It's kind of true. Do you agree with that story? Well, it's interesting how it plays off the Jewish story. Was Moshe Rabbeinu, as Ellen said before. Was Moses an Egyptian? Well, he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Did, did he have a Jewish education? Did he go to a yeshiva? Or did, was he raised in, the, in Pharaoh's palace? There are many Jewish traditions, by the way, in the Midrash that say that Moses was a famous Egyptian general and a hero before he switched his careers and, uh, and became Jewish. In other words, returns to his people. And so the notion, especially as an Egyptian would tell it, of Moses being a renegade Egyptian, you can understand that. True? Um, this business about the lepers and the others, that's very, very interesting. But the key point is that um, the Jews were not who they say they are, and the Egyptians didn't persecute them uh, without reason, but rather being naturally unclean and polluted and so forth, uh, they constitute a, me a, a menace to the rest of Egyptian uh, society. And uh, naturally, it was only prudent on the part of the Pharaoh to do something about it, especially since the gods told him to. Okay? Um, this is a partial rendering of the story, but you know how it goes. You put a story out there, even if it's on the news, and by the time it's retold and retold and retold, you know, it picks up a life of its own. I'm sure we all know the game of uh, whatever they call it at the party where one says something and the other one, by the time you finish, uh, you know, it, it's not quite exactly what it was in the first place. Um, we have a wonderful example of this in the Roman uh, historian Tacitus. Um, this book that I just mentioned with this story is written about 250 BCE or so. Keep that date in mind. Um, it's floating out there, and it actually constitutes a competing narrative uh, with the Chumash, with the Bible. We do know that the translation of the Torah into Greek had huge, perhaps unforeseen, uh, consequences because the fact that people who are not Jewish are now able to access, if they wish, the Bible and even not the oral law, just the text of the Torah triggered, among other things, a great wave of conversion to Judaism over the next centuries. I often uh, like to remind people, if one went to a synagogue uh, outside of Israel in the 200 BC, 100 BC, or the year 1, or year 100 even, 
uh, I would bet you on a Saturday morning, one would find more people attending services who were not Jewish than were Jewish. After all, one does not have to be Jewish to enter a synagogue. We don't have anything to hide. Um, many, many people, we have lots of records of this, uh, were interested in Judaism for a variety of reasons, one of which being that there was an intellectual crisis of paganism at that time, uh, among many. The old religions weren't quite working. I'll return to that later. People were looking for something new. Many new ideas were popular out there. One of them, not the only one, but one of them was this religion called Judaism with these Bible stories. We know from the Talmud and other places that, um, what shall I say, the word conversion doesn't necessarily mean what it means today, that uh, there's a formal process with a court and you know, the halachic uh, requirements. The Talmud says somewhere in my house on Purim, we, we talked about this, the Talmud says that in the time of uh, Purim, for example, the Talmud, I repeat, says in the time of Purim, many people declared themselves Jewish, just like that, and uh, they're accepted. The final halacha is that they are considered Jewish. The technical term for this in Hebrew is gerim gerurim. And even in the Middle Ages, there are some opinions out there. That's not what we do today, but I'm talking about the way it was once upon a time where it was more fluid, and I'm sure there were a lot of different opinions upon it once upon a time, but it doesn't matter. The actual reality was that people showed up and they said, we want to be part of this and we declare ourselves part of this. And you had 100% Jews, meaning people who completely went into the new religion with all the requirements, 80%, 70%, 50%, 30%, and so forth. There were people who say, I like this Shabbos business and kosher, but the circumcision is not for me. And there are other people who said, I like a Passover, but uh, the Seder's really turn on, but uh, you know, Yom Kippur uh, fasting is not for me. And uh, you might say, this is not fair to pick and choose and all the rest of it. Uh, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong or fair. I'm saying that's what happened. And this is a result, clearly. This phenomenon existed throughout the Greco-Roman period. This is a result, clearly, of the translation of the Bible into Greek and the expo exposure of the stories and the lessons and the laws, even, that one finds there, expounded from the synagogue, as we're doing at this moment, by people called Maturgamons and other things like that. Uh, which captured the imagination of many, many people. Uh, princes, kings, and other aristocrats and nobles converted to Judaism during this period. Oh, um, these are all recorded, uh, let alone uh, commoners. And so, lots of people are hearing about the bad Egyptians. <laughs> and lots of people, especially when it comes to Passover time, are saying, oh, the wicked Pharaoh and the good Jews and all that. And you can understand that the Egyptians don't like this at all. And one of the results is that Alexandria, which was the capital of Ptolemaic Egypt at that time, becomes the world center of intellectual anti-Semitism and the chief source, place where anti-Semitic literature and, and, and uh, pamphlets are composed, some of which survive today and some do not. Um, it's just a constant production of it. And uh, there's no question that this is connected, as I say before, with the fact that if you're Jewish, what can I tell you? The Bible's not politically correct. Uh, they do criticize the Egyptians, and the Egyptians do not like that. Now, that means that if you're talking about the 200s, the 100s BC, the 100s, and all that time, there are two competing narratives battling for the attention of the world. They're just there. Uh, one is ours, one is theirs. One is the Jewish one, one is the Egyptian one. There's no question in my mind, I, I can't prove this, but I think that uh, the composition of this institution that you and I call the Passover Seder, which has its origins in this period in history, is a result of this uh, battle uh, for narratives and which should get out there. Um, many know that according to the Torah, there's no such thing as a Seder. There's no such thing as four cups, four sons, the Manishtana, and all the rest of it. This came later. Um, in spite of the fact it came later, the Mishnah and the rabbis are very careful to say every person has to have four cups. You, you, know, you have to give the poor, you have to sell your clothes even, you, you have to do whatever it takes to have the mitzvah of, of four cups of wine. You, know, you better be at that Seder and you better care. Why? It's a constant ideological battle going back and forth. Uh, who's more successful? Don't know. I can tell you one thing. If we look at uh, one of the most famous Roman um, intellectuals, historians of the uh, late first century, in other words, 
56 to 117 CE. So what is that? That's Tacitus. Um, anybody here have a classical education when they were in high school had to read this, this kind of stuff or in college? Tacitus is one of the most famous Roman historians. Very good one, too. And uh, he's a Roman aristocrat. He doesn't know any Jews. They don't travel in his circles. He's a senator. Uh, what does he know about Jews? He knows the same thing about Jews as you probably know about the people, I don't know, in Ceylon or something like that. I mean, you know, a little bit. And, and, and probably what you'll tell me is wrong. Uh, because it's not something you, you just pick up rumors. And maybe today, with Wikipedia, it might be a little bit different world. But they're wrong too sometimes. And so, listen to this. Here's an educated guy. This is one of the most educated Romans who's, running, who's, who's writing one of the most distinguished works of classical literature. The histories and the annals of Tacitus are uh, legendary and, 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 and uh, models of the classic uh, culture. And he says over here, and you'll just find this interesting. Mind you, this is written in the old-fashioned Latin, so uh, the long two... two <laughs> The old-fashioned sentence is two independent uh, clauses connected by a semicolon, you know. And uh, he says, being now, he, he's, he's talking about the war of the Romans against uh, Jerusalem, Titus destroying the city of Jerusalem. And he says, being now about to relate the catastrophe of that celebrated city, it seems fitting I should unfold the particulars of its origins. In other words, who is Jerusalem? Who are these Jews anyway? The Jews, we are told, escaping from the island of, from the island of Crete, at the time when Saturn was driven from his throne by Jupiter, settled in extreme parts of Libya. Whoops. <laughs> You're trying to tell me Gaddafi? No. Um, well, very interesting. It turns out there were Cretans. Of course, I don't mean that with an I, but an A. Um, every rumor has a source of truth, piece of truth in it. It's not the Jews that come from Crete, it's the Philistines, the Palestinians. Uh, the Philistines, we're told, in the Bible and in history, actually came from the island of Crete. And so he's a Roman, and you know, he heard that somebody in Palestine over there, they all came from uh, Crete, and who cares? Uh, the name is, is, is adduced as a proof. There's a mountain called Judea over there and all the rest of it. Others say that the population overflowing through Egypt in the reign of Isis so that there were too many, there was a certain element of the Egyptian population that was getting too many, it was relieved by emigration into the neighboring countries under the concept, conduct of Prince uh, Jerusalem. So there's some truth to that. I mean, we believe that. Am I right or am I wrong? That uh, the Jews once were in Egypt and they uh, were overflowing. The Bible says that the Egyptians couldn't take it anymore. And then they over left and they settled, not perhaps under the leadership of a guy named Jerusalem, but whatever. Many state that they are the progeny of the Ethiopians who were impelled by fear and detestation to change their abode in the reign of King Cepheus. And you know these Ethiopian Jews claim that they're the oldest Jews. There are those who report that the Jews are a heterogeneous band from Assyria or northern Iraq. A people who being destitute of a country made themselves masters of a portion of Egypt and subsequently settled in cities of their own in the Hebrew territories bordering on Syria. Yeah, that's the Torah's version. Are we Iraqis? Abraham comes from southern Iraq, right or wrong. Ur Kasdim, Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, Arami of Adavi, So uh, that's who we are. So, you know, rumors are flying. Very many authors agree in recording that pestilential disease, which disfigured the body in a loathsome manner, spreading over Egypt, Bacchus being the king, he repaired to the oracle of Jupiter Hamon in quest of a remedy. So there was a, what we call today a public health outbreak. Okay, we have some nurses here. And uh, it's a public health menace. The pharaoh naturally did what you do in those days. You don't go to the National Institute of Health, you go to the oracle of the gods. And he was directed to purify his kingdom and exterminate that race of men as being detested by the gods. And so all these dirty people and unhealthy people who are typhoid Marys have to be rounded up uh, for the benefit of the community in a whole and exterminated. Now, they didn't have concentration camps 3,000 years ago, so it means you throw them out of the country and throw them into the desert. And a mass of people thus was searched out and collected together and were in a wild and barren desert abandoned to their misery. Interesting. When all the rest being bathed in tears and torpid with despair, Moses, one of the exiles, admonished them not to look 
for any aid from gods or men, being deserted by both, but to trust themselves to Moses as a heaven-commissioned guide by whose aid already they had warded off the miseries that beset them. So he basically said, you put me in charge, I'll get you guys out of here. They agreed, and they started a venturous journey, not knowing whether they went, and nothing distressed them so much as the lack of water. This is a theme throughout the Bible, correct? They're always complaining and there's no, no water. And now they lay stretched throughout the plains ready to expire. When a herd, herd of wild asses, returning from pasture, went up a rock shaded with a grove. Moses followed them there, forming his conjecture by the herbage that grew in the ground, and he opened copious springs of water. This is their version of Moses hitting the rock and the water coming out. This was a relief, and pursuing their journey for six more days, they arrived in a land called Canaan, and they set themselves up, or they took possession of a country on the seventh day, <laughs> um, where they built their city and dedicated their temple. Interesting. So uh, the Jews didn't leave Egypt, they were thrown out. You know the old story, you didn't quit, I fired you. And uh, why were they thrown out? Uh, lepers, uh, other loathes them, pestilential diseases, because you know who Jews are. Okay. And so it's not surprising, actually Pharaoh was doing the right thing. And uh, these people had the strange luck that this Moses guy assumed control, they should have all just died in the desert from from lack of water, but uh, this guy found them some water in a rock, and they were able to get to their uh, destination, take over another country. In order to bind the people to him for all time to come, Tacitus says, Moses prescribed to them a new form of worship and opposed to those of all the world besides. But the Jewish religion, this is a Roman senator, is weird. Whatever is held sacred by the Romans with the Jews is profane, and what in other nations is unlawful and impure with them is permitted. Now, uh, Maimonides subscribes to this opinion of many of the rules in the Torah as well. The figure of the animal through whose guidance they slaked their thirst and were enabled to terminate their wanderings is consecrated in the sanctuary of their temple. So that means that in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, in the Holy of Holies, in Jerusalem, Tacitus is reporting to us, the Jews have a statue of a golden ass with a boy in it, a donkey. And everybody believed this. Uh, we know from Josephus that when uh, Pompey, the Roman general, uh, seized the uh, temple the first time, when they didn't destroy it, they just captured it, he went to the high priest and he says, where's that golden statue? He wants the gold. And uh, he was going to kill the high priest because the guy said, we don't have such a thing, it's not true. Until he finally convinced him that it was a legend. But everybody knows that the Jews have a statue of a donkey because that's how they got out of Egypt. The donkey found the water. Um, while in contempt of Jupiter Haman, they sacrifice a ram, or what we call the carbon Pesach. Those you take the animal which is worshipped in Egypt and they sacrifice it. These Jews abstain from the flesh of swine. Why do they do that? <laughs> a Roman would really be bothered. You know, why, why don't you eat uh, pork? Well, the answer is obvious. From the recollection of that loathsome affliction which they formerly suffered from leprosy to which the pig is subject. So every time they look at a pig, they think about dirt, and they think about their ignoble origins and how dirty they were, which caused them to be kicked out of Egypt in the first place. The famine with which they were uh, for a long time distressed is still commemorated by frequent fastings. A Roman couldn't understand Yom Kippur, let alone Tishabov and this other thing. You know, why would you have a whole day where you can't eat? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, it must be that they're thinking this, they're reliving the old days when as slaves in Egypt or in the desert they constantly fasted. And the Jewish bread made without corn, without leaven, which you and I know as matzah, is a standing evidence to their seizure of corn. In other words, they used to steal. And they were slaves. Uh, wheat. Because that's what slaves do. If you don't watch them. And uh, it had to be real fast. You know, well, when you're stealing uh, bread, you want to make it as quickly as possible. You don't have time to leaven. And uh, there's, there's your matzah. There's a new spin. They say that they instituted a rest on the seventh day because that brought them rest from their toils. But then, I like this, charmed with the pleasures of idleness, the seventh year also was devoted to sloth. <laughs> uh, they couldn't understand the concept of Shemitah, that farmers would spend a whole year uh, not working unless the Jews are addicted to idleness and laziness. Uh, he has a little more to say. These rituals and ceremonies, howsoever introduced, have the support of antiquity. Those these go way back when, and to a Roman, like Tacitus, anything that's old is legitimate. 
but the other Jewish institutions which have been extensively adopted. A lot of people out there aren't Jewish are picking this up. Are tainted with execrable knavery. In other words, they're just disgusting. For the scum and refuse of other nations, renouncing the religion of their country, were in the habit of bringing gifts and offerings to Jerusalem, hence the wealth and grandeur of the state. Uh, people are going for this cult, these Jewish missionaries, where they're abandoning their family and they're uh, stopping being normal and they're not eating uh, pork and they're spending whole days in idleness. And who knows whatever else they're doing. It's a cult. And this is disgusting, and the scum and refuse of the other nations. Now, any Roman or any Greek that would subscribe to this is scum, okay, by definition. And uh, also, because faith is inviolably observed and compassion is cheerily shown to one another while the bitterest animosity is against all others, meaning these Jews are too clannish, and they hang out with each other too much. They eat and lodge with each other only, and though a people of unbridled lust, they admit no intercourse with women from other nations which he cannot understand. Among themselves, no restraints are imposed. And that they might be known by a distinctive mark, they've established the practice of circumcision. All who embrace their faith must submit to the same operation. To a Roman and a Greek, circumcision, um, as is being debated in San Francisco today, if you follow the news, is a barbaric ritual. You couldn't understand that at all. And so what can we do? These Jews come from an ignoble background. Uh, they were, as I say before, nothing but trouble from day one. Uh, Pharaoh was right to kick them out. Um, they, they, they attract the lowest elements out there uh, to their faith and their culture. Uh, the first thing instilled into their converts is to despise the gods, to abjure their country, and to set at naught parents, children, and brothers. You hear this even today. They show concern for the increase of their own population, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, I don't need to say much more about this. You get the idea. This guy... He subscribes to that version of Passover. That's the way he heard it. And he's educated. He's a senator. He's got a better education than most people. He's one of the elite of the Roman Empire. The officials and the intellectuals who inhabit the East, uh, many of them, they identify with the other version of the story. And that the Torah's version of the story is obviously a Jewish lie to uh, sort of self-justify. Uh, but educated people know the real truth. And it's just very interesting that at the same time, the Jews are developing these set of ceremonies called the Seder, in which they say, every Jewish family has to make every one of the family be there, and you tell our story. Because what they're saying about us is a lie. And we even want the wicked son at the Seder, don't we? As you all know. Uh, because whether he likes here or not, let him hear our story. Whether he re don't let him buy into the other story, because otherwise, uh, we've really lost it. And uh, yeah, it's going to be four cups, it's going to be four questions, it's going to be all the other rituals. And the Jews, as you know, evolve a very powerful ritual, the Seder, which is, till this very day, uh, the most widely accepted of all Jewish rituals. I'm sure you know from um, surveys and other things that uh, if there's any ceremony that most Jews... Uh, still adhere to is the Passover Seder of one type or another. If there's any ceremony which has captured the imagination of people who are not Jewish around the world, it's the Passover Seder. Uh, President Obama is not interested in shaking a lulo, but he does come to a Seder, as did President Bush and uh, Reagan and uh, Carter and Ford. I remember this. And uh, uh, Bill Clinton, of course. And uh, it's interesting. Like I said, they're not coming there to fast on Yom Kippur. They're not coming there to spend all night learning at, uh, on Shavuos in the White House. But they are having a Passover Seder because they can understand the universal themes with which it's associated. And there's just something about the way they put it together with the wine and the matzah and the mar that draws people from such a wide variety of backgrounds. It's just really interesting. Whoever came up with this really came up with a powerful anti-Egyptian narrative set of ceremonies. That worked. I mean, he, look, here we are thousands of years later, and everybody here knows what I'm talking about. You can't say that about too many religious institutions and ceremonies. Okay? Now, let me say that the, uh, the rabbis in the Talmud are very familiar with the Manitho version and the Tacitus version. Uh, those who know the Medrash or in the Book of Esther, 
will know, and some have studied this with me in other places, uh, that uh, when the Haman, when Haman sends out his uh, letters uh, to kill the Jews, in the story of the book of Esther, uh, he prefaces it with the whole account of how bad the Jews are. Look what they did to poor Pharaoh. Let me see if I can give you a, a short version of this. And you'll hear an interesting argument. It's always good to hear the other side. Yeah, here you go. This is in the Midrash, what Pharaoh said, that uh, from the beginning of time, the Jews have been ungrateful, as witness their behavior towards Pharaoh. With kindness, he received them and their wives and children at a time of famine. It's true. He gave them the best of his land. That's what it says in the Bible. He provided them with food and all they needed. And then Pharaoh decided to build a palace. And he requested the Jews do a little bit of work for him. They began to work grudgingly and been murmuring. And it's not completed until this day. <laughs> right? They immediately wanted a union and a lunch hour and all that. In the midst of it, they approached Pharaoh and they said, we want to go and worship God. We need a three days journey. Uh, we petitioned to lend us, by the way, give us some gold and silver <laughs> and things while we go away for three days. So much did they borrow, each one took 90 donkeys out of Egypt with them. And Egypt was emptied out. And then they didn't return after three days, so naturally Pharaoh went to get his money back. And they had some guy named Moses, who was an arch wizard, who was bred in the house of Pharaoh, and he drowned him in the sea, and look what an ingrate he was. Okay? Uh, you can, this is in a Jewish text. You can spin it that way if that's what you wish. And that's how many people in the classical world, the Greco world, understood the reality of the story of Pesach, of Passover. Okay. Now, what happened? Uh, here's a fascinating example of the law of unintended consequences that I always like to refer to. The period that I'm speaking about, the 200s BC to 100 BC and all that, is called the Hellenistic era. And it was characterized by all sorts of phenomena, especially religious and cultural phenomena. The Greek or Macedonian rulers had conquered a gigantic area and tried to spread the Greek culture of one sort or another over a huge, vast area where there were already existing, long-rooted uh, native cultures. The best example of that, but not the only one, would be Egypt. You don't need me to tell you the Egyptians were out a long time before Alexander came along. And so the pharaohs and all the uh, famous culture, the pyramids, the hieroglyphics and all that, long, long, thousands of years. But then the Greeks uh, took over and they imposed or they, uh, you know, th through impressing everybody, it captured the imagination of the peoples of that era, and they gave up their religions and adopted the Greek ones. It's really interesting. That's why it's called the era of Hellenization. Only the Jews did not change their religion, but the Jews changed a lot of their culture. The Jews Hellenized culturally, uh, but they didn't switch their religion, although some came close. Uh, we call this episode Hanukkah, but, you know, it, was, uh, uh, it, it, it wasn't an easy matter. But there was a great deal of cultural Hellenization um, among the Jews. I always like to bring the example that the leading rabbi, I repeat, the leading rabbi of this era was named Antigonus, Antigonus E. Soho. Antigonus is not a Jewish name. One would not imagine Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi uh, Harold or Mark Feinstein, you know. Uh, it's interesting that the Hellenistic culture did penetrate quite interestingly into uh, the Jewish culture. The Talmud says, that the practice was that on Saturday morning you read the Torah from a scroll in the ark written in Greek, not in Hebrew. I repeat, it's not that they read it in Hebrew and translated it into Greek. That happened some places also. But the Torah itself was written and read in Greek. But one could not imagine, it's in Mar Megillah, one could not imagine this today to have an English uh, Torah, but they did it once upon a time because as the, as the Talmud tells us, Greek is particularly beautiful. Yaftal Himiephes, it's Yafe. Okay? It's just interesting. And you see there was extensive a cultural penetration among the Jews, but they did not switch their religion uh, for a variety of reasons. But the, Egypt, the, uh, excuse me, the Greek religions went through a crisis of a confidence during these centuries. This is well known. Lots of people began to disbelieve in it. And what had worked in the old Greece when there were small city-states before Alexander came along, that Athens believes in the god of Athena and the, uh, Sparta and this and the other. It worked for them in that context, but it didn't work so well for the masses of people elsewhere. And so there came a breakdown of religion. And history teaches us 
that when there's a breakdown of religion, it's not replaced usually by atheism, but it's replaced by cults, by extreme ideas. Okay? Religion is sort of defined as kind of normal. Uh, we know about sin. We know nobody's perfect. We keep pushing people to try to be better. Uh, but we all know people stumble, and we can work around that. In a cult, if you don't listen to the rules, you get killed or something like that, right? There are, there are drastic consequences. And this was a characteristic of this period in history. Um, and so, the best example is Egypt. I mentioned before, if you want an example of what I'm talking about, the priest Manetho, who wrote this famous and controversial history book and an account of the events of the exodus of Egypt. Manetho was the high priest of Serapis. Serapis is a combination of gods. You see, to the Greeks, the idea of worshipping an animal in an animal uh, um, build was like uh, retrograde, primitive, weird. On the other hand, to Egyptians, that is what gods look like. Um, as you know, I'm sure, a Greek god is human. Um, in the time when the Greeks are ruling Egypt, the Macedonians, uh, Manetho and uh, Ptolemy II, they create a new cult called Serapis, body of a man, head of an animal. Get it? Uh, and this is syncretism. You mesh together existing Greek ideas with long-lasting old Egyptian ones. And you're trying to make a chalent, as we say in Yiddish, to uh, make everybody happy. It's a period noted with a lot of borrowing back and forth. This is the period when all kinds of interesting religious phenomena uh, take place. Um, the one which is the longest-lasting and the most important of the religious phenomena which pop up during these centuries, we call Christianity. Um, historically studied, it of course emerges in the first century and uh, has elements of Judaism, elements of Hellenistic uh, beliefs, paganism, elements of Egyptian paganism. As a matter of fact, very strong elements that we trace back to the Egyptian uh, side. Uh, just to give you a short uh, little uh, example of this, um, from Egypt came the notion of the trinities of divine powers, which was innate in the ancient Egyptian religion. The mystical connect, connect, connection of Isis, Osiris, and Horus is a prototype of a vast development of Hellenistic theology. Egypt is the homeland of materialistic theology, where God's a form, material form, of the notions of the immaculate conception, the divine incarnation, the various chambers of the afterworld, and Hellenistic theology is marked by a gradual surrender of Greek to Egyptian thought. Uh, there's a lot more than that. Um, it is out of Egypt that we have the idea of eating uh, God's body and drinking the blood. Um, it, is, it is originally out of Egypt that we have the idea of monasticism of various types. Now, they go through a lot of development. I'm collapsing a lot into a few minutes, but nevertheless, you see the combination of long-standing Greek ideas over a course of several centuries with very powerful Egyptian notions which mesh together, and eventually, in the first century, they actually mesh together with Jewish ideas as well. And out of the whole thing comes the early Christianity, which the Christians fought over uh, for quite a while to get exact definition of what they believe in. Um, there's a Nicene Creed, there are many other forms of Christianity. Uh, the Christians themselves uh, preserve records of what they call the various heresies, in which there were many, many, I mean many, different groups which had different ideas, radically different ideas about the nature of God, the nature of this, that, and the other, I mean, uh, you, you name it. And uh, they were pretty violent over it. And the form of Christianity we have today kind of evolved uh, through politics and through other uh, ways, and obviously caught the imagination of millions of people. But that's a fact. It spoke to them, but nevertheless uh, has all kinds of elements in it if you study this historically. Egypt was the great center of anti-Semitism, as I told you before. The early elements of Egyptian culture which penetrated in Christianity are accompanied by anti-Semitism, or anti-Judaism to be more exact. The current term is Judeophobia. And the, uh, there's a book by Professor Schaefer. And uh, those elements in early Christianity, very anti-Judaic, as the Jews at Tantum were very anti-Christian, have their real source in terms of their passion in Egypt. Uh, a lot of these ideas that I just mentioned, uh, the Immaculate Conception, the, the Trinities and all the rest are, are accompanied with, with powerful notions that the Jewish stuff is bad and stubborn and narrow-minded and uh, ethnocentric 
and uh, selfish and lying and all that sort of business. And out of all that emerges the triumph of Christianity, because that's what happens. Over the course of the one, two, and three hundreds, uh, the Christian faith spread and spread, in spite of persecutions. This is a fact. And eventually, as I'm sure many remember from school, the Emperor Constantine in the early 300s, the Roman Emperor, adopts Christianity as his personal religion, and before long it's the official religion of the Roman Empire, and the other religions are done away with, they're suppressed. And uh, he has whole councils, the Council of Nicaea, to decide what exactly is the official doctrine and theology, but they hammer it out. Okay? What's really interesting then is that this new religion, Christianity, which has such a heavy element of ancient Egyptian culture, and it, as I just indicated it does, eventually um, constitutes itself as a form of Judaism, because that's what Christianity is. It actually argues that it is the true Judaism, and that the, our Judaism is wrong. What does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, it means that if you're an Egyptian, living in the two, three hundreds, you can uh, cuss out the Jews all you want. You can subscribe to all the kinds of descriptions that we said before. Uh, you can regard uh, old-fashioned Judaism as I say, being a narrow and retrograde in, in every respect. But you've got to buy the Jewish narrative because you've got to believe in the Old Testament. You've got to buy the story of Moses and Pharaoh as we tell the Passover story. You have to surrender the Maniso account. You have to, sw in its place, pick up the uh, Bible account. Now, you can, and they do, reinterpret it. And so Moses may come out to be their first Christian, and Pharaoh may be representing, uh, you know, old Judaism or something like that. You can play those games, and they certainly do, because after all, give a clergyman, a rabbi, or anybody a chance that they can mold anything into anything. But nevertheless, uh, you have to uh, buy into that account. The new religion does many things to the Jews. But one of the things it does is spread the Jewish story around the world. Christian missionaries, not Jewish, go to the four corners of the earth, as we, you and I know. And as a result of their efforts, the story of the Bible, including the very powerful story of Passover, the very powerful story of these slaves who had no hope and were stuck in Egypt and all the rest of it, and then Moses comes along and God says, I'm going to get them out of there. And all the story down to the crossing of the Red Sea and the drowning of Pharaoh's army are known in Africa and Asia everywhere. Thanks to the medium of Christianity. And that's not the only story that they pick up, but it's one of the very powerful stories. And as I said before, it resonates with people around the world. So much so that the triumph of Christianity meant the death of the old Egyptian narrative. Even though, ironically, the triumph of Christianity was propelled, especially in the ideational sense, very much by Egyptian ideas. But in order to get that going, you had to pay the price. You had to become a Christian. And if you're a Christian, then you're a kind of a Jew. That's how they define themselves. And therefore, you can have a different take on the Jewish story, but it's going to be the Jewish story. And as a result of that kind of ironic or interesting or piquant episode, um, everybody's heard of our tale, uh, nobody until tonight has heard of theirs, even though it's out, and these are books that are out for a long, long time, but uh, it got buried in uh, oblivion, pretty much, except for scholars and uh, ancient historians and things like that, uh, because, uh, not because of anything we did. Uh, although, we still do keep up the old form of the old fight. We still every year have a Passover Seder, you still have the retelling of the story. And the enemy is dead, but we keep fighting anyway. I might be wrong. Now listen to this. I'm reading from the forward, from 2003. Egyptian scholar planning lawsuit over Exodus gold. A prominent Egyptian legal scholar is preparing a lawsuit against Jews around the world over gold allegedly stolen in biblical times during the Jewish exodus from Egypt. Uh, this is not a fool. This is not Bill Hilmy, Dean of the Faculty of Law at Egypt's so-and-so university. Now it's this plan in the Egyptian government weekly, according to the Middle East Bureau, et cetera, et cetera. And he's going after the Jew. He planned to launch a lawsuit. And this is the president of a law school. Uh, and he's got a Facebook, too. I saw it yesterday. And uh, now Bill Hilmy. And uh, he called 
the, uh, you know, the Hilmi report told Al Aram, this is the uh, New York Times of, of, of Egypt, that if the story of Exodus is to be believed, Jews are fleeing from Egypt, stole from Pharaonic Egypt, gold, jewelry, cooking utensils, silver ornaments, clothing, and more, leaving Egypt in the middle of the night with all this wealth, which today is priceless. Calling this alleged heist the greatest fraud history has ever known, Hilmi said that he and a number of Egyptian jurists plan to sue the Jews around the world for these lost treasures, the value of which he figures in the trillions of dollars. And he goes on to, if you want to see it, you can, uh, I'll, I'll show it to you later on. Anybody can take a look at it if they wish. Um, what's really cool is that uh, he's serious about this. He's preparing a whole legal team back in 2003. And Dershowitz says, <laughs> you know, make my day. <laughs> Bring it on. Well, listen to this. Helmy did not specify where he planned to file the suit. But should the case have reached a courtroom, Alan Dershowitz, a Harvard Law professor, told the foreword, I'd be happy to defend the Jews. <laughs> this would be quite a, uh, uh, be quite a uh, scene. And I want to tell you something. Um, I couldn't find the exact place, but I remember seeing this years ago. The reason this never ca uh, came to court was because the Egyptian authorities told this guy, do not bring this lawsuit. And the reason is because if you do, you'll be acknowledging the Jewish narrative, and you will be saying that the current state of Israel are the same Jews from long ago. And one of the key arguments in the Arab platform is, I'm sure you know this, the current Jews have nothing to do with the ancient people of Israel once upon a time. They're Europeans or something else that stole the land, and they'd rather forego a claim of trillion dollars than say that there's any validity whatsoever to the Jewish narrative, which speaks volumes. I will conclude tonight with a second article that appeared one week later in the foreword, which is, gives a little hope for uh, the future, called A Muslim Defense of Jews on Trial by a guy named Hesham Hasabala. And he writes as follows, I thought the class action obesity lawsuit against McDonald's was the silliest thing in the world to hit a courtroom until I read about an Egyptian scholar who's planned to t take on the Jewish people to court for an alleged crime committed millennia ago. And he goes on to describe all this. Um, and he says, I read that Dershowitz said I'd be happy to defend the Jews. Well, this guy says, so would I. And I'm not a lawyer and I'm not Jewish. <laughs> a Muslim defender of the Jews? Absolutely. Do not be surprised, for Moses, you see, figures prominently in Muslim belief. He's one of the five mightiest messengers of God, along with Noah, Abraham, and some others. The, the Quran says that God bestowed his grace on Moses and Aaron. He was specially chosen by God, and God bestowed on him wisdom and knowledge as a reward for doing good. In addition, the book of Moses is described by the Quran, known as the Chumash, as we call it, as a light and a guide. At least 73 Quranic passages, many of them encompassing several verses, talk of Moses. And uh, in fact, there are more verses about Moses in the Quran than about Muhammad. The Quran tells of two miracles. Moses' staff turning into a serpent and his hand glowing when he placed it under his arm, that God permitted as proof of his prophethood. It details the plagues that were unleashed on the Egypt for their refusal to believe in God and set the Hebrews free. My favorite part of the story, the splitting of the Red Sea, is mentioned twice, at least in the Quran. The entire Exodus story, for me, is a happy one. It is a tale of bitter bondage and hardship and the glory of God's deliverance from that hardship. And this guy's a Muslim, but once again, he finds meaningful and he identifies with this story, just on the Torah Shebik Sav, just on the plain level. I was so intrigued by the whole idea of the lawsuit over the Exodus that I did some research. The good Egyptian scholar might be surprised to learn that the Quran does not mention any reference to the Hebrews taking gold and silver out of Egypt. And it goes on and on. And again, if anybody's interest is all online, and, and, and if you want to, you can read the articles over here. And so I end on that note because we're all looking for a little bit of light. <laughs> at the end of the tunnel. The battle uh, over Israel's legitimacy today is the big one, as Ellen was mentioning before. It's the same kind of thing again. People tell big lies. And uh, once again, I'm sorry to say, many of the intellectuals of the world, the Tacitus of today, the movers and shakers, professors, uh, writers, uh, media people, uh, buy into the counter-narrative, uh, no matter how it is, because they're really uh, motivated by who knows what. The happy story that we end with is, uh, here we are today. Uh, our traditions, uh, symbolized most powerfully by the Seder of Pesach, by the Pesach of Seder, uh, shows us that uh, we stick to our guns and 
they will be forced to change through thoroughly unexpected <laughs> uh, reasons. Uh, some of our uh, greatest enemies may turn out to be, ironically, our defenders, whether they uh, desire it or not. And it goes to show us, however, that if I talk about a battle over whose truth, uh, this is not something that only happened uh, 2,500 years ago, but it's a, almost a definitional aspect of being a Jew. Abraham was called the guy on the other side, Avram Ivri. He was on the other side of the world, meaning he uh, did not conform. Uh, if you ask Nimrod what's the story with Abraham, he could give you a different account than, than we would. Uh, we uh, maintain our, the integrity of our story, and uh, that's how uh, we survive. I hope everyone will have, as they say, a happy uh, Passover, and uh, when you are at your Seder, uh, you're striking a blow. Good night.